So the research institute that I work in is called the uh, uh, Marx Institute for Brain Behaviour and Development. Uh, we have uh, many different areas of research. We do uh, biomedical engineering, robotics. Um, most of the research is psychology or med medical research. So the research program I work in is uh, to do with music cognition. And we do a lot of research around the effect of music on the brain and uh, music for in health contexts. So, uh, as Stefan explained before, a lot of my research has been about dementia, the effect of music on dementia. And of course, in dementia, um, of course, people have problems with memory, but uh, sometimes a bigger problem is the behavioral and the psychological symptoms. So, depression and anxiety and agitation. Uh, depression affects between 20 to 60 percent of people with dementia and there is a lot of evidence that when de uh, depression is present it can accelerate the decline of the individual. Um, agitation occurs in up to 80 percent so it can accelerate the decline. It also has a big impact on quality of life. So the people with dementia and their carers say that these symptoms have the most effect on their quality of life. Um, of course, the reason for um, these symptoms, like depression and anxiety, are, are very complicated and the staff that are caring for them need to go through a lot of possibilities to work out uh, why they may be feeling uh, some agitation, uh, for example, they may be in pain, um, it may be something to do uh, with personality, life history, the type of dementia that they have, something to do with the uh, care situation. So because it's, uh, the causes of these symptoms can be very complicated, it's also um, very complicated to treat. So the uh, most common treatments, of course, um, I'm not sure if it's the same in New Caledonia, but in Australia, the most common treatments are pharmaceutical, so antidepressants, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines. Um, but there are a lot of problems when this medication is overused. So uh, people may have a lot of comorbidities, so many other conditions, and using multiple medications uh, can cause many complications, um, many side effects, and often the evidence is that uh, these medications are not effective for everyone, not as effective in the older populations as they may be in younger populations, um, at times even causing confusion or death. So um, some of the international recommendations are that for these uh, psychological and behavioural symptoms, uh, pharmacology should be um, not the first step. So for example, uh, this study from the American Geriatric Society, they say that non-pharmacological treatments um, are effective and they should be the first line of treatment. So they should be the first thing that is tried, um, the non-pharmacological treatment. Uh, this one is from the German Society for Neurology. They also say all available and usable psychosocial interventions should be exhausted before any pharmacological intervention is considered. And this one from the Italian Association of Psychogeriatrics as well, also suggesting that non-pharmacological treatments are, are really important uh, as a first step to treating these, these types of situations. Um, unfortunately, despite these recommendations in Australia, we have a big problem that the aged care homes are very, um, uh, they don't have enough staff and the staff don't have enough time. So recently we have had a big uh, national investigation about the standard of care in aged care and unfortunately uh, a lot of these, um, am I on the right side? Yeah, they, they have found that around 80% um, of the residents in aged care homes are being prescribed medications um, 
as the first step. And this is a, quite a, a big problem. It seems to be a, um, just a habit for the staff to use, to use this. It's called, um, we call it chemical restraint. So because the staff don't have a lot of time, if there are behavioural issues, they need something to work quickly for them. So they will just uh, give them some medication because it's the quickest thing and they don't need to uh, spend very much time settling the patient. But of course this has a lot of bad effects for the patients and so this uh, national investigation and the uh, Human, Rights, Human Rights Watch group in Australia is now calling for um, them to outlaw the use of chemical restraints for people with dementia. So in Australia it's a very critical issue. I don't know if it's the same here in New Caledonia, but it's a very critical issue to find uh, good evidence for the non-pharmacological uh, treatments for these symptoms, um, which is what I just said. So, uh, Stefan explained a little bit before, of course, we have many different ways that music can be used from uh, a trained musical therapist. Uh, we can also have other health professionals using music, volunteers. The way we individually use music in everyday life has an effect on our well-being as well. And our environmental music has an effect on our well-being as well, the music that we don't have control over. So my interest has mostly been not in, uh, in the use of music without a trained music therapist because there is a lot of evidence that music therapy with a trained therapist is very effective but uh, usually the therapist comes once a week and what do we do the rest of the time? So my interest has been in what we call playlist interventions, so pre-recorded music and uh, how that can be used in between the music therapist visits to help the, the patient. Just to give you an example of um, how effective music can be, this is some research by a colleague of mine. Yeah, it should have a video there, but is it working? I hope you can understand it. This is Norma. She's 91 years old and has severe dementia. And this is clinical neuropsychologist Dr. Amy Baird. Do you know my name? No. I'm Amy. We've met a few times. So the main difficulty she has is forming new memories. Norma, do you know who I am? My name? Just a mm. couple of minutes ago I told you my name. Can you have a guess? <laughs> That's alright if you're not sure. It starts with A. A. It's Amy. It's Amy. Yeah. She can't recall three words after a minute. Right? Starts with A. Somebody that I don't know. No. <laughs> but incredibly, Norma can learn a new tune. I taught you a new song. Oh. Yeah. It was called the Norwegian song, or well, that's what we called it together. Do you remember learning that new song? No. no. Alright, I'll start you off, Norma. Uh -uh. See if you can sing along with me, okay? So the song went La 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 As far as Dr. Baird is aware, this sir, I don't know if you can understand that, but um, she can't remember Amy's name. She doesn't remember meeting Amy, but she can remember the song, the new song that Amy taught her. So we don't completely understand why, but somehow the musical memory, even the capacity to learn new information is preserved uh, for people with dementia until quite late stages. So it really demonstrates the potential for music to be useful for, the, for this group. Um, so we conducted a, a systematic review of the literature to look at how music is being used. We looked at 28 different studies, um, mostly studies just using pre-recorded music, so uh, not so much uh, other types of music therapy. Uh, we found that it, it can be very effective uh, to reduce a lot of symptoms, in particular agitation, even when there is no trained music therapist there with the patient. 
we did find that the results were not always positive. So that suggested to us that there is a need to find some uh, standards, uh, to develop some standardised ways to use music with people with dementia so that we can make sure it's being used effectively because the results were not always positive in many of the studies that we looked at. Uh, we also found that, um, so again in, in Australia what often happens is the in an aged care home, uh, maybe in the living area, they may put some ABBA music for everyone. If I listen to ABBA, I will feel very agitated. <laughs> so for me, that wouldn't work. It doesn't work for everyone because it's not the music that they love. So this type of, this way that aged care facilities mostly use music just to play one kind of music for everyone is not, not so helpful. But most of the studies in the past with people with dementia, they either, they may often use the researcher selected music. So they say, uh, okay, dementia, people have agitation. Classical music is relaxing. I will play classical music for everyone. Of course, it doesn't work. If you don't like classical music, you, you won't feel happy listening to that. And then the other type of study, they may say, let's choose the favorite music for this person, but they don't think about the symptoms of the individual. So for example, if you, uh, uh, when you go to the gym to exercise, you will use different music compared to when you want to sleep. So the same for people with dementia, you need to choose different music depending on the symptoms that you want to treat. So these are the problems with a lot of the previous research for music with dementia. Of course, we found one exception to that in our review, which was Stefan's work. Yeah, he is also very famous in this, in this area. Um, because Music Care, of course, uh, produces music that is tailored to the individual, their taste, but is also looking at the symptoms, is also aware of the symptoms and using this uh, U-shaped curve, which is quite a well-established principle in music therapy. So in music therapy, it's known as the ISO principle. So this was one, one exception which seemed to be uh, very effective. But we found that um, there was a need to investigate more and to understand more about how the individual symptoms might influence the effect of the music listening and also to develop some guidelines for the staff who don't have uh, any musical training to understand how to use it better. So in this study we wanted to conduct an experiment to look at the effect of the tempo, um, so if the music is fast or slow, also the mode, do you understand mode like major or minor? Key. Yeah, okay, and also the, the lyrics, the effect of the lyrics. So we wanted to see how those features of the music were interacting with the symptoms and the mental health history of the individual. Um, so we had 99 people with dementia. Uh, most of them were not musicians themselves, but most of them did like music. And uh, we measured a number of things in the beginning. We randomized them to different musical conditions, but we selected the music based on their personal taste, their personal preferences, um, so that we were isolating the effect of the tempo and the lyrics and the mode of the music. And then we took measures of uh, mood and arousal. So, we have a wonderful software called Face Reader, which can uh, measure the movement of the muscles in your face. And it's very sensitive. So if someone has had a stroke and they don't have much movement in their face, it can still read uh, even very small movements. It's so sensitive you can uh, take the um, heart rate because it's measuring the movement of the blood under the skin. But all we have to do is film the person. No 
You don't have to put anything on their face, just filming them, and the software is very sensitive. It can measure that, and from the movement in the facial muscles, we get some idea of their emotional uh, response to the music. Uh, we also uh, measured uh, skin conductance, so we're looking at their arousal levels, and uh, for those who were capable, we asked them to rate um, their enjoyment of the music. We found that uh, when people listen to music in minor mode, we saw activation of this facial muscle. So like this, you do that when you feel sad. When people listen to music in minor keys, we saw activation of that. So although um, many of these people can't speak anymore, and when you ask them questions they don't understand, they still respond to minor music. It still makes them feel a little sad. So I find that very interesting that it's um, still part of their response. Uh, and we also found that when the tempo of the music was very fast, so this was uh, over 120 beats per minute, um, this caused increased arousal in a way that was not pleasant for the listener. But we found that the lyrics had no effect. So in our studies with young people, the lyrics of the music, the words to the music, has the biggest effect on their mood. For a young person with depression, if the message in the music is positive, this will have a more positive effect on their mood. But for people with dementia, it doesn't matter about the lyrics, but they're still responding to the tempo and the mode. So our, our conclusion from this is that things like the tempo is very important. You can't just select the favorite music of the individual. If you want to reduce their arousal levels, their agitation, the tempo of the music is very important. Um, and the minor modes for somebody with a history of depression, uh, this is what we found, they were more likely to have a, quite a negative response to music in minor modes. If they had a, a history of trauma, um, abuse or alcoholism or something like that, they were more likely to uh, have a negative response to the music. Um, we found a, a very big effect for people with dementia who had no history of depression, but they were very withdrawn and apathetic from the dementia. So the dementia is making them uh, pull inside and they're not engaging with other people very much. And for those people, the music was very effective. And it didn't matter too much what music you chose, as long as the tempo is not too, too fast. Um, we also found that among the different types of dementia, uh, people with frontotemporal dementia or Lewy bodies dementia responded very well. Alzheimer's dementia, which is unfortunately the most common form, the response was uh, very much related to their mental health history. Uh, so again, um, the, the history of depression seems to make them more vulnerable to some negative responses. So based on, on our research, we have uh, developed some guidelines for uh, carers, whether they're in um, hospitals or, or aged care facilities or some that can be used by people at home. And the idea of this guide is to um, help the carer to identify which individuals are vulnerable and to learn how to manage that and then also to learn how to identify the challenges for each individual, the biggest challenges and target the music for those challenges. Um, we also make a lot of suggestions in here about monitoring the response. So many uh, staff think it's just going to be put the headphones on and walk away, um, but it's very important, as I'm sure Music Care has the same procedure, to monitor the response. Uh, you may need to change the way you're using it a little bit, just as you do with any type of medicine. You won't just give them some antidepressant and walk away. 
you will monitor is this working, are there any side effects? So the same with music. Um, so now we have we have um, developed this. Of course, our challenge is that staff don't have time to read it. <laughs> that is so busy. <laughs> Um, so we are, one of the reasons why I'm here is I want to learn from these very experienced individuals about how they run their training programs and uh, how they're able to make this work in hospitals because uh, they really have a very good model, I think an international model. In Australia we are a little bit behind and we need to catch up to the French. <laughs> so um, yeah, and, and our plan in the future, we, we have done some trials of these guidelines. Uh, we have them used in eight different care homes, uh, some people using them at home as well. And we found that uh, the carers are reporting really reduced agitation and aggression, and they're enjoying um, increased alertness. So they're, they are waking up more, they're speaking more, and for the carers, this is really enjoyable that they can communicate with the person um, again in a way they couldn't uh, in, in the past. Even for, um, to reduce falls, uh, many of the staff are reporting that maybe at 3 p.m. Mr. Smith usually walks a lot because he's feeling agitated and he will, have, he will fall regularly. So they started to use the music at 2 p.m. and then he is not walking so much and so they reduced the number of falls in the age care home. So there are yeah, many, many ways that the music can be used depending on the challenges of, for each individual if the staff have the training. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we've found in age care homes so far, most of them, 52% are just doing ABBA in the living area. <laughs> they, they haven't really um, discovered the best way to use it. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, of course, some of the problems are the, the funding. Some of the residents don't want to do music therapy. They say, oh, that's for the really sick people, not for me. But headphones, okay, they don't mind headphones. Um, and of course the time commitment for staff and the, the knowledge of the staff. So now we are working on um, developing some training programs and really trying to help the staff in these aged care homes to understand that music is not just entertainment, but it can really be used as a medicine. It can be used, of course it can't replace um, pharmacology, but it can be used as a first step uh, to perhaps reduce the amount of pharmacology used for people with dementia. So thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed listening to the rest even in French, and I, I hope you can understand. Thank you. Thank you.